Did you know that studies tell us that some 900 million Christians have been martyred in the past 10 years? Do you know that that averages to 90 million a year? Do you know that that averages to one every six minutes? And did you know that the Assyrians are the most persecuted branch of the church in world history? We have a lot to talk about today. Stay tuned. I'll be right back. Finding and knowing God is a faith walk. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Our hope lies in the coming Messiah, who will establish God's peaceful kingdom on earth. This is Faith Walk with Ron Susak. Dr. Ron is an evangelist committed to encourage and equip your faith walk as we pass through these turbulent end-time days awaiting that soon-coming kingdom. Here again is Ron Susak. Probably one of the hardest things for Christians to grasp is this business of suffering. But the Bible is very clear about this. And I hope that by the end of this message and by the end of this series that we're beginning today on Hebrews, and this is the introduction today, that you will have a transformed view of life and the value and importance of suffering. In John chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, just let that sink in a little bit. That it's imperative that something die before life comes forth. God created the universe, showing his power of creation. He also is the God who's showing his power over death. And he's transforming death into life. That's resurrection. We see that all around us in nature. So there is a very important place for learning to die to yourself that God may bring forth a life in and through you that's absolutely amazing. Romans chapter 8 verse 17 reads this way, And if children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and fellow or joint heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him. Did you get that? We suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Wow! Isn't that an insight? We suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So there is a place to dying to self i.e. living unto God and others, dying to self and giving yourself to God's will and the interests and needs of other people, that brings a life that you can't imagine within you and within others. But also, there is a place, Jesus said, they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you also. There is a place for suffering with Jesus that we may also be glorified with him. Now, think about something. These are concepts that <laughs> they may seem abstract, but they're very real when they begin to play out in life. And that's where many Christians go off the rail and say, hey, wait a minute, I, I didn't sign up for this. Well, if you didn't, then you're missing one of the heart centers of Christianity. By the way, the martyrs also had trouble with this concept. Let me read for you Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 10. See how the martyrs, people who have already been martyred for the reason of following Christ, what they said. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little, a little longer, until the number of their fellow servants 
and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been, until the number is complete. Wow! That's soul-searching. Think about that. Those who have already been martyred and they're under the altar waiting on the vengeance of the Lord. Vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. When will this come to pass, they're asking. Isn't that a surprising insight into the other world? God said, wait. When the number is complete of those who are to be martyred for my name's sake, then recompense begins. Then it's all over but the shouting. But wait a little longer. My friend, you may be going through great suffering today. Persecution by other people, or a suffering brought on by life, or by God, or by circumstances. Before you just throw up your hands in despair and say, what is it all worth? It's worth everything if you're going through it for the namesake of Jesus Christ. There were five missionaries who were martyred in Ecuador some years ago, back in 1956. One was Jim Elliott, and he was 32 years of age. Another was Peter Fleming, he was 27. Another was Ed McCauley, he was 28. A fourth was Roger Uderain, Uderian. He was age 32. And Nate Saint, age 32. It was June 8, 1956, that these five men were martyred. Now, I knew Nate Saint's brother, Ben Saint, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I was raised there, and I would go to these youth rallies. And Ben Saint was a, a huge, massive guy, great guy, phenomenal personality, led the singing. And one time at one of these big rallies in Soldier and Sailors Memorial Hall in Pittsburgh, I, I asked him, Ben, tell me about your brother. He said, Ron, those five missionaries did not have to die. They had high-powered rifles hanging at their sides. They chose to die rather than kill the people they were trying to reach for Jesus Christ. Now, sounds like a sad ending. A movie was made of it. A book was written about it. Sounds like, a, sounds like a sad ending. No, it wasn't. It was not an easy ending, but two of the widows went back to that tribe. And interestingly enough, that tribe was engaged in all kinds of warfare with other tribes and killings. They were revenge killings. And they had no word in their vocabulary for the word peace. They had no understanding of that. Vengeance was theirs, is all they understood. Anger, bitterness, rage, and savagery. As a result of these two widows coming back, I'm talking about Nate Saint's, Nate Saint's sister, Rachel, and Jim Elliott's, Elliott's widow, uh, Elizabeth. M many of you know about Elizabeth Elliott, who's now with the Lord. But these two women went back. Interestingly enough, this demonstration that we killed your five husbands, two of you have come back to show love and care for us. They now had a context, an experiential context for understanding peace. And as a result, the very man that murdered Nate Saint ended up adopting his son as his own. And they became the closest of friends. I'm talking about Steve Saint, a man who built airplanes in order to help missionaries around the world. Now, Hebrews, all of that background is coming up to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews was written to persecuted Jewish Christians. They were discouraged, they were defeated, they were drifting. Did you get that? Discouraged, defeated, and drifting. The book was written about 70 to 80 years after Christ. Now, some of these people may have been actually converted to Christ on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached that great sermon. All we know is that decades had gone by and these people had undergone consistent persecution. 
cast out of their families. <laughs> you believe in that Jesus out of here. We disown you. They were had their property stolen from them, probably lost inheritance. Their children couldn't see their grandparents. They were physically beaten. They were thrown in jail. After a number of decades, they had had it. They were thrown in the towel. Well, my friend, this study we're going to do in the book of Hebrews is a study written directly to those people. And I am dedicating this series to the Assyrians, not Syrians, Assyrians, the people in your Old Testament of your Bible. Yes, they're alive today. Yes, they are a nation. They don't have land. They're scattered around the world, but they're alive and well, and they're honoring Christ. But my friend, I'm dedicating it to them because they are the most persecuted church in existence. Now, let me give you their background. In the Old Testament, many people don't realize that during those days, while they overstepped their boundaries of authority and God brought them down to 612 BC because of that, still, they also were the, the creators of the cradle of civilization. You and I are using things from the door lock on your home to you name it, coming out of their skills and what they offer to humanity, their governmental system, their education, their, their library. They were the advanced people. And by the way, there's no question that Nahum the prophet talks about how harsh they were, but don't ever fail to balance that with Ezekiel chapter 31. We'll be talking about these things someday where God shows how he made them great and how they, while they conquered different nations, they also blessed them immeasurably. So much so that when Assyria fell, Ezekiel 31 tells us, the nations mourned, they mourned, they mourned. Now, if you hated these people because they were unbearably impossible, you wouldn't mourn, you'd rejoice. No, they were mourning because their livelihood, their structure, all that the Assyrians had brought with their brilliance was now gone. Well, I want you to know that the Assyrians, here's the amazing thing that few people know. Think about this now. After Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, the Assyrians were the first, was the first nation on earth to follow Jesus. I'm talking about as a nation. There were other converts before that. But as a nation, they declared their willingness and readiness to follow the resurrected Jesus Christ. And they went on to the most amazing life you could ever imagine. They took the gospel of Jesus Christ and the great commission of Jesus Christ very seriously. And with bare feet and bread in one hand and a Bible in the other, they went from northern Iraq, which was not Iraq in those days, but that it was Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers. It was, it was the nation of Assyria. They left that land and walked some 3,400 miles. A about the distance from New York City to Los Angeles, they walked to take the gospel to China. And the Chinese called them the luminous religion. We found that on a steel that they dug up, the luminous religion. They also took the gospel to Japan. St. Thomas, after he brought them to the Savior, went all the way to India. My friend, think about this. The Assyrians, who you read about in the Old Testament, but we failed to know their history in the New Testament era, because that information didn't make it from the East to the West, sadly so. And I'll tell you why it's sad. They are your and my spiritual forefathers. They were the front runners. They were the megaphone of the gospel in the early church. And I, I don't have time in one telecast to tell you their history. It's enormous. I, I've written a book about it. In fact, I'm going to take a break right now and 
ask you to watch this ad for this book. Think this through as you watch this ad. Now, Dr. Ron has been talking to us about the end time days and wants us to prepare for the coming kingdom. And he has written a book titled The Assyrian Prophecy that is a missing part of the end times puzzle. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Write, for these words are true and faithful. The world is not ending. God is preparing a new world soon to begin. An ancient nation thought lost to extinction is soon to rise anew to prepare for that day. Isaiah identified this nation in a prophecy that has been hidden in plain sight for some 2,700 years. Its name is Assyria. My new book, The Assyrian Prophecy, reveals how Assyria will join with Israel and Egypt to bless the world under the soon coming Messiah. Amid today's chaos, God is searching for righteous people through whom he will bring the prophecy to completion. When you reach the end of this book, one question will be in your mind. Lord, what would you have me to do? You can learn more at theassyrianproject.org. It is my deepest hope that you will get a copy of the Assyrian prophecy. Simply write to me at theassyrianproject.org. Theassyrianproject.org. That's the least expensive place where you can buy one. It's for a 25% discount. Call today. Write today. Contact today. Get a copy of this book. It's very easy reading, but it's a ton of information that you're not familiar with. Therefore, just read a chapter a day. And in one month, I'm telling you, if you just take 20 minutes a day to read a chapter, you're going to have a whole new worldview that you will deeply appreciate. Please get the book. But what I want you to see is when I say they were, are the most persecuted church, I just want to give you one example. They were persecuted under Genghis Khan, Tamerlane. Uh, again and again, they were persecuted in World War I. They were violated and betrayed in World War II. They were attacked by ISIS in uh, 2014 and 15. You remember that? You saw it all over the news. They were the center of targets. And here's what's very interesting. I'm going to take you to just one scene. When I say they were, are the most persecuted, I, I'm going to take you to one scene. In World War I, they were given the promise that if they would help the United Forces win the war and stop Turkey and Germany, that they would actually give them their land back protect them as they became a sovereign state and nation once again. Ah, uh, my friend, what a serious error that was. But they were in a trap. If they didn't fight for the Union, they would fight for other. They were going to be killed from one side or the other, so they had to join one or the other. That was a horrible, horrible dilemma they were in. They fought valiantly. Amazing stories of how they helped the right people win World War I. But at the end of the war, the English, the Brits, had a mandate to take care of the region now called Iraq. Well, they put the Assyrians in charge of policing Iraq. The Arabs hated that. But that's the way it was. And then, all of a sudden, England thinking, we don't want to spend this money policing Iraq. We're out of here. They ended the mandate. And everything flipped over. And the Arabs were now over the Assyrians. So what did they do? They said, okay, you Assyrians, you can live in little villages up in the region called Sameli. About a hundred villages, but you can only have 100 families per village and no weapons. Yeah, you, you see the handwriting on the wall, don't you? Of course you do. In 1933, the Arabs went up into Sameli, and they absolutely massacred some 3,000 Assyrians. During World War I, get hold of this fact, 
over two-thirds of the Assyrian nation was martyred just for being Christians. I hope that you are becoming a member of my one in a million team. What is that? I'm not asking you to join an organization. I'm asking you to stay in the church where you are. I'm asking every pastor and every bishop and every patriarch and every believer on earth to join me, become part of this team that we're calling Faith Walk. What, what is our goal? Our goal is to equip and encourage one million Christians worldwide to bring an average of 100 people to salvation in their lifetimes. Now, you may only be able to bring one, a husband, a wife, a son or daughter, or you may be able to bring a thousand. But if we average 100 apiece, we will get a 100 million people out of the hands of Satan, out of the grip of hell and into the glory of heaven. Think about that. Now back to Sameli, what happened there? I'm going to read for you a description of exactly what took place. A, an Assyrian lawyer named David P. Purley wrote about this, and I think he did the finest job possible. Here's what he wrote. What actually happened in the north of Mosul, the scene of the massacre during the first weeks of August 1933, surpasses in horror anything imagined by Dante and his vision of hell. Some 65 villages were looted and destroyed. Women were raped and made to march naked. They were then ripped open with knives and made sport of while in a state of agony. Priests were slaughtered after being barbarously tortured. Holy books were placed over their bodies and burned with them. Little girls of nine were raped and burned alive. When there was no one left to kill, the armored cars proceeded to dash backwards and forwards through the dead and dying in all 3,000 defenseless Assyrians were butchered. The massacre was preceded by the proclamation of a holy war against the Assyrians and attempts made to forcibly convert them to Islam. Pause there. That's only one scene, my friend. Now, why am I honoring the Assyrians and dedicating this series to Hebrews to them? Remember now, Hebrews is written to persecuted Christians. The Assyrians, that's only one scene. Down through the centuries, they have had their daughters abducted, raped, and sold into sex slavery consistently. Going on right now. Their wives raped and murdered. Their husbands and sons murdered just because they are Christian. Here's the part that nobody is aware of. God's eye is really on this because these people, the Assyrians, are people of a prophecy that's going to be fulfilled. Let me read that prophecy in Isaiah chapter 19, verses 23 to 25. In that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and Assyria will come to Egypt, and Egypt into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Do you get the picture? This is where the world is heading. Assyrians, go with this whole study with me in the book of Hebrews. Everyone watching, go through this book with me. You will be so challenged, so thrilled, so excited, so ready to, to pay any price to honor the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, knowing vengeance is mine. The day of God's vengeance is coming. And every persecuted saint, every saint martyred, every family that has a martyr in their family, and they've lost that loved one, and there's an empty seat at their table, they will be vindicated. They will be rewarded. God is a perfect, 
judge. My friend, if you are hearing this and you're saying, Ron, I, I've never thought about this. I've never heard these things before. Where do I stand in this? First of all, if you're a persecuted Christian, stand firm. Don't waver. This is a call for standing firm. I know it's tough, but the reward is far measured, far beyond the hardness of the hour. Secondly, if you're saying, Ron, I'm not even sure if I know Jesus, but I want to. I, no matter what the cost, I want to be His. I want to know Him. Well, I'm going to give you a prayer, and I want you to pray after me, but think this through. Make it your prayer. Let's pray this together. Dear God, on the basis that Jesus died for me, I am trusting your forgiveness for all my sins. I am asking you for the power to live committed to you from now until I meet you in heaven. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, let me know. And my friend, you know that we have a, 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 a program called One in a Million. I'm trying to raise up a million Christians worldwide who will try to bring an average of 100 each to salvation to get 100 million people out of the lake of fire and into heaven. I want you to be one of them. Go to our website, faithwalk.org, and let me know that you want to stand with me so we can keep in touch. And we're going to move forward because the King is coming. God bless you. Wonderful to be with you today. Looking forward to our next session. And remember the name Emmanuel. It means God is with you. This has been Faith Walk with best-selling author, pastor, and evangelist Ron Susek. If you would like to know more about Dr. Ron and our mission, visit our website, at faithwalk.org. Dr. Ron would also like to invite you to join his growing team called One in a Million. Our goal is to encourage and equip one million Christians worldwide to bring an average of 100 people each to salvation. This will result in 100 million people joining us in heaven. To let Dr. Ron know that you want to stand with him as one in a million, go to faithwalk.org and sign up today. Well, thanks for being with us today, and we hope you'll join us again next week as we find courage for the journey in our faith walk.